Thank you, Beth, for getting the recording in motion. And um, we are moving along in our Les Miserables series. Uh, we are going to spend time today with Javert and the song Stars. And for those who have been with this class for a long time now, I did touch upon this in one of my previous iterations of the class, but um, I promise something new, as I always do. So we're going to look at uh, the song stars and compare it to the promise that God gives to Abraham, that your offspring shall be like the stars of the heaven. And really this isn't about the stars per se, but about constancy and about something that we can depend on, something that we know will always be there, even in the midst of uncertainty. So we'll look at that with, with Abraham and his offspring and the nation of Israel in general. But when it comes to Javert, you know, this is a point in the musical where we've actually just been introduced to another part of the, of the cast and the plot, um, which is the student rebellion. And we'll get more into that in our next class. Uh, but, you know, throughout these shifts in the story, one thing, the thread that runs throughout is Javert is constantly pursuing Jean Valjean. He knows this man is a convict and he knows that, um, that he has an obligation to uphold the law above anything else. And this moment is suddenly he's alone on stage and it's only him and the stars. And, um, and he swears by the stars. This is really what this is about. What can I swear by? What can be my um, anchor in the midst of uncertainty? And in a very real sense for so much of human history, the stars were a navigation tool, right? When we didn't have a GPS, we had the stars and we could navigate uncertain waters and we could navigate change um, because the stars could quite literally guide us. So we're going to listen to this beautiful song sung um, the, in the 10th anniversary concert by Philip Quest. And then we will compare it to the promise that God gives to Abraham also with regards to the stars. And I'll remind anyone who hasn't been with us before, we stay on mute for this part of our program. Um, and as I show the texts as well, and then, and then we'll open it up at the end. So here is stars. Out in the darkness, a fugitive running, fallen from God, fallen from grace. God, be my witness, I never shall yield till we come face to face, till we come face to face. He knows his way in the dark. Mine is the way of the Lord. Those who follow the path of the righteous shall have their reward. And if they fall as a loose of the pair, the flame, the sword. Stars. In your multitudes, scarce to be counted, filling the darkness with order and light. You are the sentinels, silent and sure, keeping watch in the night, keeping watch in the night. You know your place in the sky. You hold your course and your aim. And each in your season returns and returns. And is always the same. And if you fall as a loose of a pair, you fall. And so it must be 
It's a glorious song. Um, I should say that the film version with Russell Crowe, I could never play. I would not, I will not play it for you. I refuse to because Russell Crowe, as great an actor as he might be, he is just, well, he's not a singer. Let's, let's leave it there. Um, and many in the theater world were kind of appalled by that casting. Um, but but this performance, this is a Javert with who's supposed to be, you know, constant, steady, solid, that deep, booming baritone voice. Um, and notice some of the themes. You know, he says, "Be my witness." It's about something um, that that can testify on his behalf. Um, also, notice that the theme of um, those who are righteous will have their reward is very important for Javert. He's not a bad guy. We, we, we can't really resent him. He, he's just doing his job and he believes that crime leads to punishment and righteousness leads to reward. And once a criminal, always a criminal. Um, and, and the stars are this sign of order and light, as he says, order and light, um, and and even as things change, you are always you are always the same. Um, there's a distance also from the stars, you know, scarce to be counted. That's that's what we're going to see actually in in the biblical text. Um, but uh, so so that grandeur um, and that mystery helps the stars be something that we can count on, um, even though we can't count them. So let's look at the text. I'm putting the link into the chat for anyone who wants to open it on their own computer. And I'll share it here. So we are going to move through. There we go. Okay. We are going to move through the uh, first place where God promises to Abraham swears by the stars that you're, you know, actually God doesn't swear by the stars, but, but says your offspring will be like the stars. But then we're going to go through a series of texts. It's not just Abraham, but later um, his son Yitzchak will have the same promise. Later, even Moses himself will refer back to that promise. So uh, we're going to skim through a bunch of texts. This is Breshit, the, the book of Genesis chapter 15. Um, where it all begins. So God comes to Abraham and Abraham is a little bit, uh, well, uncertain. He says, um, you promised me offspring, but I still don't have a son with Sarah. And uh, all I've got is this servant, Eliezer. And God says, okay, I'm going to make you a promise. You will have an heir. And I'm, I'm skipping now to verse four. This is really where the promise begins. Verse four, Pasuk Dalid. Um, God's, Vihine Devar Hashem Elav, God's word came to him, Lemur, saying, Lo This, the servant, will not be your heir, but rather a child that you will still bear. Ki im asher echa, hu yirashecha. Your heir that you will still birth with Sarah um, will be will be your heir, your son. 
And then God says, come outside and take a look at the sky. Look up at the heavens. Count the stars. Scarce to be counted. <laughs> um, you cannot count the stars. So shall your offspring be. And, uh, and this is considered a moment where Abraham has faith in God. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many commentators on all of these verses, but we're not going to really delve deep. You know, in, um, in Jewish text study, there's always a tension between what we call bikiyut, covering a lot of ground, and be'iyun, diving, taking a deep dive in. So I often prefer the bikiyut, the big picture, you kind of move through it, but if we wanted, we could spend an entire class on this one verse, the deep dive. We're not doing that, but we're doing thematically this one idea. So um, God kind of goes on and on. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Ur Kasdim. I promised you this land, and I've skipped a few verses here. And then God promises to Abraham this very well-known promise that we recite in our Haggadahs every year. You shall know, surely, your offspring will be strangers in a strange land, and they will be enslaved 400 years of oppression. But after it, uh, I will judge that nation that they serve and they will leave that land, the land of Egypt, with great wealth and on and on and on. Um, and then there's again, a, a, a covenantal moment. I skipped over the part where he's cutting up different animals and there's the fire through the middle of the animals. Uh, but here really we see it is a breach. It is a covenantal moment. Verse 18, by Yomahu Karat Hashem et Avram Brit. So this is what we call the Brit Ben Habtarim, the covenant between the parts. So this is, uh, this is what God is promising to Abraham, a land and a nation. And so this nation that will be like the stars in the sky will conquer this land, this land of all of these uh, different nations, the Kani, Kmizi, Chiti, Prizi, da, 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 da. This is, this is the first time we see the stars. You will be like the stars. And it comes back again with Abraham after he's had a son, Isaac, and after he has um, nearly sacrificed that son, but shown that he is 100% committed with faith to God. That's also another class, the Akedah. And after the Akedah, it does make sense that, you know, if, if Yitzchak has come through that ordeal, now God will reiterate the promise. This is the one. This child will bear your offspring. So um, in verse uh, 16, um, God says, because you have done this, you have not withheld your son, your favored one. You've, you've agreed, you know, to almost sacrifice your child to me, which maybe God never really wanted him to do. Okay. Um, verse 17, ki verach, varech, excuse me, ki varech avarechecha, I will bless you, veharba arbe ezar acha, and I will make your descendants extremely numerous, kik hochve hashamayim, like the stars of the heaven. And then here we get the sands also, like the sands on the seashore. And they will be very successful against their foes. And this is a continuation of the original blessing, the Lech Lecha blessing, which we didn't look at today, but you will be a blessing to the other nations. Um, Rachel, how come, how come he didn't? What's that? How come he didn't make us as numerous as the stars and as the sands on the seashore? Well, <laughs> let's let okay, so let's hold let's hold on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but compared to you know one measly guy with one child, millions came out of him. So it's all relative. Maybe yeah, okay. <laughs> the other nations are as many as the galaxies, but at least we've got the stars in this galaxy. <laughs> um 
but I think it's, it's a promise of plenty. It's a promise of, you know, your legacy will not end here with you and not even with your child. Um, let's, let's, let's hold off on taking it literally, of course, but really thinking about what does this image of the stars convey for Avraham? So it, it, here it conveys the numerousness, um, but also I think, you know, the reason I, I, I feel it's such a good match with the Javert scene is that it's a reassurance at a time when there's just one man and just one son. I mean, we know it's not gonna go through Ishmael, so it's only gonna go through Isaac, Yitzchak. And God has to say, rest assured, it's not, this is only the beginning. And even the, the path ahead will be difficult with the slavery in the future, but you will um, come through it and be numerous. And yes, I see a comment in the chat. Um, thank you. Right. We would be much more numerous. Yeah. So I'm, I'm fast forwarding now to his son. His son Yitzchak gets the same promise. Um, at a time of uncertainty, it's a time of famine. Go, go to Avimelech and don't worry. God says, I'm going to fulfill the promise to your father, Avraham. And then in verse four, I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky. And you will have this land. So again, there are, it's a double promise again and again throughout the book of Genesis. The covenant has to do with a nation and that nation is tied to a land. So this nation and this land and this mission of the other nations of the earth being blessed through you or this mission of justice or light unto the nations, you might say. And this is, uh, so this is not now with Abraham, but with his son Yitzchak. The stars are always there from generation to generation. So I love this excerpt. I'm moving on. We've left the book of Breshit. As I said, we're marching through rather quickly. And this is in the book of Exodus, the book of Shemot, where it's a tough time. It's, um, this is the, the Parsha where we see the sin of the golden calf. We just recently read this Parsha in synagogue. Thank God in person in synagogue which is so wonderful. And for anyone who feels ready and comfortable to come to shul, we want you in shul. So um, it's Moses speaking to God and saying, wait a minute, God, you had a promise. You have to, you know, don't destroy this people and even keep them going and bring them into that land. Remember your, your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob here. It's, he's called Yisrael. Asher nishbata lahem bach you promised them. You said, I'm going to make your, your offspring as numerous as the stars in the heavens. And this land, I will give to them. I will give to your offspring. They will possess it forever. So God, you made a promise. Those stars are still there looking down. Now, it's not exactly the stars are the witness. We're going to get to that in a few moments. We will see that later in the Torah. But the stars um, are the reassurance throughout these generations. That even when God gets mad, we can point to those stars and say, you promised. You promised we're going to be here just like the stars are here. And you promised we're going to be as numerous as they. Okay, we're not taking that literally. So I, I just want to show you one commentary. I apologize, this wasn't available in English on Safari. I'm just going to read aloud um, the underlined part. So this is the commentary of the Ha'amektavar. He was also known as the Nitziv, Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda of Berlin in the 1800s and uh, in, in the yeshiva of Valajan in Belarus. He he writes about what the stars symbolize. Why stars? What does it say about this nation? What does it say about this promise that the nation should, should be like the stars? 
So he says, that the greatness of this nation will be like the stars that give light to the community. To La Rabin means to the communal, to others. Visham Haitaha Kavana, there with the promise to Abraham, that was the intention. Le'inyan Chochma, with regards to the wisdom that will be spread throughout the world because of us. The Jewish people are like stars being lights. So we usually say lights unto the nation. We, we usually use that expression in terms of our mor moral leadership. Which we're, gonna be, we're gonna be a light unto the nation and show the world what, what morals and ethics and, and godliness could look like. But here he says, chokhmah, wisdom. We're enlightening people, quite literally. And then he says, that was then the first promise to Abraham. But the second promise now to Isaac is another aspect of stars. So not only do they, do they light up those around them uh, with wisdom, now God is adding to promise to Isaac, that his children will be lightened with so much blessing and wealth <laughs> like the stars. So not only will be will benefit others, but we too will be bright and confident. And he says, Osher, wealth, that we're gonna, we're gonna be, we're gonna be sustained. So we'll give light to others and it will in turn uh, benefit us as well. So two kind of in-depth interpretation of what it could symbolize, what it could mean to be like the stars. Uh, I'm going to move from stars into the skies in general. So before we do that, just to summarize what we've seen, we've seen God promise to Abraham uh, in the Brit Bain Habtarim, in the covenant between the parts, that his offspring will be numerous. We've seen God reiterate that promise with regards to Isaac. And we've seen Moses use that promise to stick up for the nation successfully. And then just here's a, you know, one deep dive into one example of what it could mean to be like the stars. And um, yes, and Elaine is continuing on this thread of why we aren't more numerous now than we, we, we might've been. The Northern Kingdom, the 10 tribes were lost and it's only the offspring of two tribes that remain. The 10 tribes were, were exiled much earlier, hundreds of years earlier and kind of lost among the nations. So I, I hadn't, this I hadn't thought of before, but as I was considering um, the stars and, and the way that, you know, Javert says, um, you will always be there, be my witness. Uh, it really, um, it helped me realize that not only the stars, but the skies, the heavens, the heavens and earth are called as witnesses in this covenant later, much, much, much later at the end of Moses' life. Now, I'm not sure that there's a direct connection to the promise to Abraham and the promise of you will be like the stars. So I'm a little bit I'm playing with this. I'm, I'm using maybe some poetic license, but I think um, this was something that, you know, looking at Les Mis in this way um, made me see this aspect of, of the Torah narrative in a new light, no pun intended. And, and that's, by, by the way, that's what this project is all about for me, coming in to the Torah text through a side door and seeing something new that I hadn't seen before. And I started thinking like, why does Javert refer to the stars? Because they're always there and they'll always be witness to him. So it's not only that he wants to be like the stars, he wants the stars to be assuring him. And even when he is gone, the stars are there. So at the end of Moses' life, Moses' job is to ensure the continuity of the nation and to ensure that they keep this covenant with God, they keep the Torah law, and he calls heaven and earth as his witness. I mean, two witnesses, actually, that's the rabbinic court of law, <laughs> calls two witnesses. So his two witnesses are not human witnesses. They are 
celestial witnesses. They're heaven and earth. And even the language, by the way, Shamayim Ba'aretz brings us back to creation, brings us way before the covenant with Abraham, brings us to a covenant with humanity, if, if there was something like that. The, the covenant with humanity that we had was the, the rainbow. But heaven and earth, Shamayim Ba'aretz, are now going to be the witness that uh, the people of Israel have to keep this Torah. Now, Moses is talking about it in a threatening way. So he says, I call heaven and earth witness that when you sin, and trust me, you will, because I know you guys, you're going to leave God, you're going to worship idols, um, heaven and earth will be witness that this and this punishment will come. You will perish from the land that you're crossing into. Um, you're going to be, it's a little, it is a threat. It is a threat. It is a threat of exile. Of course, it did come to be. They got back to the land eventually. But Moses is, is the harsh Moses here. And Moses is invested in, in their obedience. And if you're going to obey, then um, heaven and earth are there to enforce it when I'm gone. Oved tovedun maher me'al ha'aretz. You're going to perish from the land. Asher atem ovrim et hayarden shama lirishta. That you're about to cross the Jordan in to inherit or possess this land. Um, yeah, a little bit of a threatening Moses here. And uh, and that's the beginning of the book of Devarim. So it, there are actually sort of bookends to the book of Devarim. Remember, the entire book of, De of Devarim is essentially Moses' last speech to the nation or a series of speeches. Um, it's in his final year of his life. So he begins the book with, I'm telling you, you better listen. And he ends the book very much similarly after having reiterated many of the laws we saw, after having also retold some of the stories um, and having encountered a few new things. He then says, okay, take this Sefer Torah and again, heaven and earth will be my witness. So um, this is the last text we're going to read. Oh, there's a Rashi. I forgot about my friend Rashi that I brought for you. This is the last Torah text we're going to read. We'll spend a little bit of time reading through it. And I guess I just want to encourage you to think about what it means for a person to swear by the heavens or to swear by the stars or to swear by means heaven is my witness. Um, so he says at first, take this Sefer Torah, uh, the translation here, book of teaching, is helpful because we don't know if that Torah is literally the entire Torah. Maybe it's the entire Torah minus the last few verses about his death. But v'lakach et sefer ha-Torah hazeh v'sam temoto mitzad aron brit Hashem Eloheichem. So take this Torah, this scroll of teaching, at the end of my life, everything that I'm giving you including all the stories of the patriarchs and everything I learned at Sinai and everything since and put it at the ark and let it be your witness, the Torah, the, the, the words. And I know that you are stiff-necked. Your rebelliousness. Your stiff-neckedness. Hayom, even as I'm still alive with you, you're constantly rebelling. Mamrim hayitem im Hashem. You are rebelling against God, even though I, Moses, who talked to God, are right there. So how much more so when I'm God? Afki achare moti. You're going to keep rebelling. Verse 28. So when I'm gone, I want you to know this deal stands. Hakhilu elai et kol ziknei shivtechem veshotrechem. Gather uh, the elders of the tribes and the officers. Va'adabra be'oznehem. I'm going to speak to them, the leaders who will be here when I'm gone. Et hadvarim ha'ele. All of these words. Ve'aida bamet hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. And I'm going to call heaven and earth as witness. Against them is is the translation here. Bam means for them. So. I think against them is because this is, again, a, a threatening witness. Like uh, the punishment will come when you turn aside. Verse 29. I know that when I have gone, when I am dead, 
you are going to act badly. You're going to stray from the path that I commanded you. And bad things are going to come because you strayed from that path. Uh, I want you to withhold the, all the theological questions. I know that's hard, but you know sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes good things happen to bad people. Sometimes the nation does nothing wrong. And, but this is, this is the theology of the moment in the Torah where Moses is saying, keep this Torah, you will be rewarded. It's Javert, right? And stray from this law, you will be punished. Bad things are going to happen to you after all those days. Because you will have been doing evil in the eyes of God with your actions. Um, and then Moses begins a shira, a poem, which is known as Shirat Ha'azinu. It's the Parsha of Ha'azinu, which is entirely poetic. And even if you ever see the Torah scroll, pay attention when, you know, we go, Vizot HaTorah, Asher Sam. So there's um, a different layout for the points of the Torah that are that are poetic, that are songs, right? The Song of the Sea is a different layout. And this Shirat HaAzinu is, is also, it's, it's, it's not prose, it's poetry. So, um, so Moses opens the Shira of HaAzinu with heaven and earth being the, the witness. So Moses says the words of this poem, Divrei HaShirah Hazot, to the nation of Israel. And I just stopped after the first verse, but it goes on and on and on. But Moses says, listen, O heaven, and listen, O earth. <laughs> Again, you are my witness. Ha'azinu ha'ashamayim ba'adabera, I will speak, and the heavens will hear. Batishma ha'aretz imrefi, it's parallelism in the, in the verses here, and the, the earth too will hear what I say. So the last piece that I'm bringing for us today is our good friend Rashi, who articulates everything I've kind of already been saying, which is that why would a human being who is about to die call upon heaven and earth as witness? Because heaven and earth, Zion, heaven and earth will be here after I'm gone. And, and the stars, I mean, now we know the stars are constantly changing, but back then the stars were always there. Here's Rashi. Rashi is commenting not on that particular verse in Deuteronomy, but one a neighbor, a neighboring verse. He mentions heaven and earth a few times there. <clears throat> so Rashi says, I call witness against you the heaven and the earth, for they exist forever. Shehem Kayamim Leolam. And when evil happens, when the bad things happen that I'm telling you are going to happen because you're going to stray and you're going to need punishment, they will be witness that I have warned you with regards to all of this. So this is actually a courtroom terminology. You can't convict someone under Jewish law, under rabbinic law, unless there are two things. You need edim and hatra'a, a witness and a warning. It's a formal warning. If the person wasn't told this is wrong and here's what the punishment will be, then it, then it can't hold up in a court of law. But Moses is saying, you have witnesses and you have witnesses to this warning. It's, it's fascinating. And I see, Michael, your hand. I just want to hold off until I um, read the rest of this Rashi. So, so number one, they will be my witnesses and they're here after I'm gone. And then there's something else that he adds, davar acher, another explanation. And this is where Rashi um, <coughs> quotes a midrash, ha'idoti b'chem ha'yom et ha'shamayim, on this verse. Amar lahem ha'kadosh baruchu Israel, The Holy One, blessed be he, God says to the nation of Israel. Histaklu b'shamayim shebarati, it's a quote of God. Look at the heavens that I created, l'shamish etchem, at your service. I created these heavens for you. Shema shinu et midatam. Have they ever changed? Shema lo ala galgal hachama min hamizrach. 
Was there ever a day that the sun didn't rise in the east? Ve'hi'ir lechol ha'olam and gave light to the whole world. You know, when you wake up, the sun will rise on, in the east. The sun isn't going to change its path. And just as it says in the book of Ecclesiastes, the sun rises, the sun sets. Da, 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 da. And similarly, look at the earth. Istaklu ba'aretz shabarati lishameshetchem. I created the earth also to serve you. Shema shinta midata. Has the earth ever changed its character? Did you ever plant something and it didn't grow? You know what, how the earth works. <laughs> it's not fickle like human beings. Okay, this is 2022. We see climate change. We see all kinds of things. But, but Rashi is saying, Shema zeratem ota. Did you ever plant something in the earth and it doesn't grow? O Shema zeratem chitim. Did you ever plant wheat and the earth decided to give you barley? seorim. This is consistency. This is predictability. Everything we know to be true and unchanging is represented by the laws of the sky and the laws of the earth. So too, uma'elu, shena'asu, uh, these that have been made, lo lishar velo said. so the heaven and earth, which had nothing to do with reward or punishment, they are doing their job if they do the right thing, so to speak, if they do their job, they don't receive any reward. And if they sin, so to speak, if the earth decided one day to give you barley when you planted wheat, there's no, you know, there's no, there's no punishment. They didn't change their ways. I just skipped a line. Atem, you if you merit you're going to receive a reward. And if you sin, you're going to receive a punishment. How much more so you should do what you're here to do. Keep the Torah, listen to God. How much more so you should obey God's commandments. That's what you're here to do, nation of Israel. So I swear by the heaven and earth who know their role, who know their job, who do as they are told. Um, I swear by these two witnesses that you should also, you should also do the same. And um, I'm seeing the comments now. I'll, I'll take down our screen share. And I, I thank you for the comments. Um, you need the two witnesses. Michael, it's, it's interesting because it's, um, in some ways it's, it's a metaphor. It's not literally two witnesses. Uh, here we go. I removed the spotlight so everyone can click on gallery if they want to see everyone else. But um, I, I guess I wanted to point out the the language of warning. You've you've been warned, and here there are witnesses to that warning, which is a legal language that Moses is using in, without a court of law, obviously, without real witnesses. But heaven and earth may be their wit their witness. Um, Yes, and the prophets repeat this, Elaine, again and again and again. Uh, and sometimes we listened and most of the time we didn't. But it's the same thread continuing throughout. And if something bad happened, the prophet would say, you see, I told you so. Change your ways and things will get better. Reunite with God, so to speak. Go back to that, that covenant. So... I'm going to pause here and look around the room and feel free to raise your hand. Don't be shy. You don't have to say anything earth shatteringly brilliant, but I'd love your feedback on any part of this. Um, uh, it says iPad burgle. I can't tell who that is. You're raising your hand. Can, can you introduce yourself by name? Yes, it's hi Burgel. Ah, oh, thank you. Okay. Oh, you know, I didn't read it. It's it was all one word there, so it didn't right. register. It says Hi. iPad. Head. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so I'd like to weigh in on another reason why heaven is so awesome, why you pray to heaven, and why you swear to heaven, Please. because the word shamayim is actually a combination of ash and mayim, water and fire. 
Now, water yeah. and fire in nature do not go together. They will cancel each, each other out. However, God can make them stick together. So they will. Re so the heavens remind you that there is a God that can make things change, that can make right. things stick right. together when they right. shouldn't in nature. Well, and that God, God is in charge of these laws of nature and right. beyond the laws of nature. You know, and even what you're talking about, I hadn't heard that before, Aisha and Mayim, that's very nice. And um, even the things that come from the sky are the, the, the light of the stars and the sun and the water of rain. So these are two things that in our human world don't mix, but, but both exist in the heavens in some, in some way. Thank you. Even though when it's raining, we don't see the, uh, the clouds come in. We don't see the sun. Okay, I could go too far down that rabbit hole. <laughs> um, thank you. But I think it's true in terms of the, also the awesomeness, right? The um, unreachability of whatever is in Shamaim in heaven. And, and that's what we're going to kind of look toward in a time of uncertainty. Gloria, I see your hand. Go ahead. Well, I'm glad you said we don't have to be brilliant and the questions don't have to be. Well, it's, it's hard. I know when it's no. room to like to unmute yourself and everyone's going to listen and what are they going to say? So no pressure. That's all. No, pre there is no pressure. I mean, we're a community. We support each other. It's uh, it's all good. Yeah, um, the, it comes down for me always to there's consequences to our actions, you know, that um you know, my mother used to say, God will punish you. It won't, may, may not be when I did the bad thing, maybe three days later, but, you know, it'll, God will punish you. But the thing mm -hmm. that um, I'm heartened by is that God gave us agency, that we have choices. We can choose to, to do the right thing. We can choose to stray from the path. So, uh, you know, we've got our part to play. We're not just pawns on a chessboard. So uh, anyway, yeah, I'm heartened so it, by it's that. About, it, it's about, um, like you say, taking responsibility for our actions, seeing consequences. Yeah, and, and that's something that- the, Any what's that Sorry. Sorry. Say, it, say it again, oh, say it again. Re, or, okay, you were unmuted for a second. Okay. Um, yes, it's- uh, Okay, I'm-, I'm what this is trying to tell them. Which is very hard for us to accept sometimes. <laughs> Annie, what were you saying? Uh, I was going to say that your what you presented today about the heaven and and uh, the skies, the stars in the heavens uncountable, the grains of sand uncountable. It uh, ties in nicely with last week's parsha of Kitisa, with the half shekel that you can't count the Jews; you have to have them each have a half shekel. So. That Very nice. nice. Maybe we don't want to be countable, like the stars and the sand. No, I think we exactly. don't. And I had her on the cuckoo too. <laughs> we don't want to be countable. There was more reasons. There was a plague if they counted. Uh, yeah. King David counted the people and then a plague broke out. I knew more about it, but. Yeah, it yeah, come yeah. That's you know, actually, more. I want to use what you just brought out to, to Evelyn's point. Like, come on, we were, we're, we're not that many. We're not like the grains of sand or the stars in the sky, but maybe choosing something that cannot be counted just gives an image, but isn't meant, isn't, we're, we wouldn't count ourselves anyway. We don't like to do that. The Jewish community doesn't, doesn't want to do that. Farla? Well, reading this um, sort of confirms or makes us think again of how how small we are and how the gift of, of, of the land, the gift that things grow, the gift, you know, of being here, we're mm -hmm. we bore, on borrowed time. And, mm -hmm. you know, reading this reminds us, that's why it's, it's so good to read the Bible because it, it, uh, it brings up the point in a big way that, you know, we have to do our part and that this is a miracle that we're here and that there is, there is some growth and a regenerative plant, you know. It puts it, things in, in perspective in a certain well, way. Yes. 
I have to say, I just um, took my kids to the planetarium this week for the first time. Well, they had been there with their father and I hadn't been the last time. So I had not, I had not yet been to the planetarium and we went into the one, one of those theaters, you know, they have the domed theater and you sit back on the bean bags or the chairs and, and um, I, I mean, the, the grandeur of the universe is, is just remarkable. And the, the movie that we watched was about the Voyager that had been sent out in the late seventies, the space, the satellite that got all the way to Neptune and then, and then out of our solar system. Um, and I, I mean, the, the sheer size of this distance, it, bo it boggles the mind and that's only our solar system. And then they started talking about the likelihood that maybe there is life in other solar systems, but it's a fluke. It's really a fluke that there would be this planet inhabitable for life um, with water, with the right atmospheric conditions. It really, it, it puts things in perspective. Um, and, and then, you know, leads you to think this is why we believe in intelligent design as the scientists would say, right? Intelligent design, we could call it God, uh, but there's, um, there's such an unlikelihood that this would happen by accident. Evelyn, I see your hand. I, I don't know if you're waiting to come. I have, I have, I have two qu qu points. Um, yeah. I'm fascinated that he understood human nature and said, when I will be dead, you will behave so badly that you're gonna be punished to such an extent. And I'm always um, terribly saddened by that because it's God created humanity and now we have free choice. I know that will be your answer, but he sh it's like we're a lemon on the assembly line of life. <laughs> that to the extent that well, they understand that man's nature is such is saddens me a great deal. You know, I think that I, I know you have another comment. I just want to respond because okay. I, as you know, I'm the eternal optimist, almost to a fault. And, um, and I'll say that the greater the potential, the greater the fall. And um, we are the most powerful being on earth, which means we have the greatest potential for harm as well. And the Torah tells a story of human error again and again and again, right from the beginning. So it, it, it doesn't stop telling that story and it doesn't stop going from generation to generation, even though Adam and Eve made this terrible mistake, even though after Noah, God said, well, I'm definitely gonna wanna do this flood thing again because they're gonna make the same mistakes twice or more times. But I just won't, I won't destroy them, even though we'll kill, keep making mistakes. Even that text actually is the most depressing. Um, God says, Okay, I understand now. Yetzer lev ha'adam ra mineurotav. Man's nature from youth is is evil. But I will never destroy them because I now know that about humankind. I know that they are imperfect. So it and there never ceases to be goodness, and there never ceases to be a story to tell. So Moses is just a realist. He's been with them for 40 years of fetching. He knows it's not going to stop now. Anyway, we can choose to see it's, it's, yeah, it's a tough story, um, but that's the beginning of the Torah and it's the end of it here. <laughs> okay. What else did you want to say, Evelyn? Yeah. The other is that the descendants of Ishmael are so much, oh, they can see me, are <laughs> so much more um, uh, like the stars of the heaven and like the sands of the sea. And uh, the uh, friend, uh, which right. we are, are such a tiny, extraordinary remnant. And uh, I'm always confused by that. Yeah, we've not had the um, advantage of history. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Don't worry, we can cut this from the record. We can cut <laughs> this from the recording. Don't worry about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Or among <laughs> friends. So uh, I wanted to play for you all. Sorry, was there a last comment? I don't know if I missed a hand. <laughs> well, 
We're all in each other's living rooms. This is what it is. That's why I have a green screen. Do you know that I'm sitting in my office with a green screen? That's why I can put up uh, all these backgrounds. Michael, did you have something you wanted to say? Because I don't know if I answered you before. No, no, just hi, Rob. I'm trying to, to work and listen at the same time. Okay, but, no problem. I am on doc. In any event, uh, just the point when you mentioned witnesses, and I had thrown a comment in that you do need the two witnesses. Yeah, for a real trial, yes. I think this is sort of an expression. We have. You think it wouldn't be needed here? Yeah. So I'd well, like, what's that? No, I would not. I just wanted to say that um, I'm, I'm just thinking that, you know, man has two sides, like you say, we have two sides, the evil and the good. And a man has to be stopped on the evil side. And it's, you know, a good example right now is Putin. He's got to be stopped. And, you know, there's, you see the evil right in front Very of real. 2022. All too and real. Yeah. There yeah. Has, to, has to be restrictions. There has to be police. There has to be government. There has to be yeah. It's when, it's when evil gets out of hand without, without consequences. Mm -hmm. um, so before I leave you with the song, I, I'm going to play you this, the same song once again, but this time from the um, original Broadway cast recording. It's just the audio, but it's my favorite Javert casting. Um, so I'm going to play that for you. I just want to remind, because I know some people came in late. Next week, class is on at the usual time with a guest team. Teacher Anita Silvert from Chicago, um, a friend and fellow Jewish educator, and she is wonderful. She'll take you down a Jewish Broadway journey of her own. So please give her a warm welcome uh, when you see her here next week. And I will give your regards to Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so um, I'm going to play now. Let me just make sure this is all. I'm going to play just the audio so you won't see a video. This is, um, his name is Terrence Mann, the original Broadway cast recording. I I don't know. I, I, I'm i sure I'm always biased toward this recording because it's the one I grew up listening to again and again and again on repeat. Uh, but I also find the his, his voice is exactly what Javert is, strong, steady, determined, and the only thing he needs are the stars. And so he swears by the stars. Here we go. Wait, and now it didn't start. Oh my. All right, we have to stop. Do this again. I apologize. I'm not sure why. Give me one minute. Hmm. Oops. Okay, now it's playing. I'm going to share it now. Thanks for bearing with me. There, out in the darkness, a fugitive running, fallen from grace. Fallen from grace, God be my witness, I never shall yield till we come face to face, till we come face to face. He knows his way in the dark, but mine is the way of the Lord, and those who follow the path of the righteous 
shall have their reward. And if they fall as Lucifer fell, the flame, the sword. Stars in your multitudes, scarce to be counted, filling the darkness with order and light. You are the sentinels, silent and sure. Keeping watch in the night, keeping watch in the night. You know your place in the sky, you hold your course and your aim, and each in your season returns and returns, and is always the same. And if you fall as Lucifer fell, you fall in flame. And so it has been, and so it's written on the doorway to paradise that those who fall far and those who fall must pay the price. Lord, let me find him that I may see him. Safe behind bars, I will never rest till then. This I swear, this I swear by the Thank you, everyone. Thank you. A wonderful week, a wonderful day.